Hello and a very warm welcome to you at Salem. I hope that whether you're a member or a friend of our church, you have a really blessed time with us as we pray together, as we read the Bible together, and as we listen to what God wants to say to us today. Today is also the start of Christian Aid Week, and if you don't already know, this charity carries out practical help and aid work in some of the poorest nations on earth. Uh, and the work that they, they do is especially valuable right now at this time of coronavirus when many of the uh, countries that the charity is working in right now lack the infrastructure and equipment that we have in the UK. So if you'd like to find out more about this work or to support it in prayer and giving, then take a look at the Christian Aid website or get in touch for more details. And we're going to begin now with a prayer written by Christian Aid, and you might like to join in with me as we pray together. God of heaven and earth, in these times of isolation, apart from loved ones, distant from friends, away from neighbours, thank you that there is nothing in all creation, not even coronavirus, that is able to separate us from your love. And may your love that never fails continue to be shared through the kindness of strangers looking out for each other, for neighbours near and far, all recognising our shared vulnerability, each of us grateful for every breath and willing everyone to know the gift of a full and healthy life. Keep us all in your care. Amen. just like to ask you a really important question and the question is this where is your heart what is your heart full of the Bible tells us the way your treasure is there your heart will be also and what do we fill our hearts with maybe in this time we have a little bit more time to think about what is in our heart we all long to have our hearts filled and it was a song that I like it says the hole in my heart that can only be filled by you and that is a true song actually because God has placed eternity in our hearts. Our hearts can only be filled when they have something that lasts forever in our hearts and the only thing that lasts forever is God and we can try and fill our hearts with all sorts of different things. Um, we try to fill it with possessions, maybe with fame or fortune or all sorts of things and there was a man Solomon he wrote a book called the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible he had absolutely everything and that he wasn't happy he talked about the chasing after the wind and he wasn't happy at all and he realized that he could only be happy when his heart was full with God and that is true for each one of us as well God has made us with a plan and a purpose God has made us to know him to have a relationship with him and we can only have that relationship with him when we realise that we've messed up. When we realise that our hearts are not always in the right place. And when we come to the cross, when we put our trust in Jesus, when we say sorry for what we've done wrong. Thank you to Jesus for dying on the cross in our place, taking the punishment that we deserve. And ask him into our life as our king, as our friend. And he will come in. He'll come into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And he will indwell us. He will give us that peace, that joy, that hope that only he can. And maybe in these difficult times, that's something that you would like to think about. How can you have this hope? How can your heart be full? It's only by coming to the cross and putting your trust in Jesus. Today's reading is from John chapter 14, verses one to 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place that I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. For many of us, one of the biggest struggles we have right now is with uncertainty. The uncertainty about what our future looks like. How long are the various restrictions of the lockdown going to last? Are they going to be relaxed, only to be tightened up again in a few weeks? Uh, when will I be able to go to work again? When can I get my business back up and running? Uh, when are the children going to be able to start school again? Uh, when are we going to be able to do any of the, the things we used to take for granted of normal life? When are we going to be able to do those things safely again? Lots of people have uh, an opinion, but uh, right now the best we have are our guesses. If we add to that the more immediate questions in the face of uh, the coronavirus pandemic, are my friends, are my family going to be okay? Am I going to be okay? When is life going to return to normal? Will life return to normal as we knew it? Or when everything settles down, will normal life just be different? Uh, will how we used to, to live and work and socialise be something that is gone, uh, replaced by something different and new? There's lots of ideas and guesses and expert opinions uh, and what have you out there. Uh, certainly there's plenty if you uh, watch or listen to the news, but no one can say with certainty exactly what our future looks like. This is very much a, a time of uncertainty. In the Bible passage we've heard read to us, uh, we find Jesus talking with his friends. He's sharing a last meal together before he goes to the cross where he knows he's going to die. He's giving his friends the encouragement and the comfort and the guidance that they uh, are going to need in the days ahead as they face what's going to be for them the most uncertain time of their lives. It's going to be a time when Jesus, their friend, the one they've lived with, they've shared meals with, they've worked alongside as he's taught, as he's healed the sick and worked miracles, their friend Jesus is going to die. And all their hopes and expectations of what life with Jesus was going to be like are going to be turned upside down. Many of us might uh, very well be able to identify with how the disciples, Jesus' friends, are going to be feeling at this time. Uh, many of us might be feeling uh, very much like life has been turned upside down. We might think about uh, the plans that we had made only a few months ago that have had to be put on hold or cancelled altogether, replaced instead by this time of uncertainty. To prepare his friends for their time of uncertainty, their time of testing and trial, Jesus encourages them. And one of the ways he does that here is through three assurances he gives, three promises that he believed his friends needed to help them get through the uncertain times that were ahead. Three promises that speak to us too and the situation we find ourselves in today. The first uh, promise that we're going to look at is Jesus' promise of life with him 
beyond death. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Death is often a, a taboo subject in our culture. It's a thing that people conspicuously don't talk about if they can uh, avoid it at all. But it's something many of us will have been thinking about and perhaps talking about more recently because of our, our present circumstances. Understandably, thinking about what happens when we die can be a source of worry and anxiety. What Jesus offers us here is the answer to that fear, the promise that through believing in him, in who he was, in what he did, we can receive God's invitation to share in life beyond death with him. In Jesus, we can face death with hope, knowing that it will not be the end, that the Jesus who died and rose again from death, it's that Jesus who promises us that if we trust in him, if we accept through him at the love, the grace, the new life that God is offering freely, that with that we can have a home with God beyond death, a home with God and Jesus for eternity. The second promise that Jesus gives us is that in him we can see most clearly what God is really like. We pick it up here in verse 8. And we read, Philip said, Lord, Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, most people I've ever met with and chatted uh, to uh, about uh, things about uh, life, death, God, the universe and everything, most of those people I've had a conversation with uh, along those lines, I discover believe in, in God in, in some sense. Often the idea they might have about God is of a, a God who's yeah, up there somewhere, uh, but who's not really involved in day-to-day in -day life. He's not really uh, connected or, or interested in the normal everyday lives uh, of people. Maybe he's a, a God who sort of sets the world uh, going like a, a clockwork machine. He winds it up and then just sits back uh, and lets it go, never getting involved, just waiting for it all to play out. Sometimes other people I've talked to, maybe they've picked up a few bits and pieces uh, from the Bible or have heard about uh, Christianity and the story of the Bible, but never really understood what it's uh, about. Uh, sometimes their idea of God is more of a, an angry God, a, a God who looks down on people with a scowl on his face. Uh, perhaps a God who seems indifferent to the suffering and the struggles of people on earth. It's a picture of God that you might pick up from time to time in films and books and elsewhere in our culture. It's a picture of God that people sometimes come to uh, as they look around and see all the mess in the world, all the things that aren't right, and they ask themselves, where is God? How could God ever be good when there's so much suffering and injustice in the world uh, around us? It's all different ideas uh, about God different pictures that people have of God, but they're not the God we see revealed in the Bible, and they're not the God we see revealed in Jesus. Jesus' words here, his promise to us, is that if we want to see God in the most clear and full way possible, if we want to know ourselves today, what is God really like? Then we'll see God most clearly in the person of Jesus. The Jesus who, we remember, loved us so much he was willing to die in our place on the cross to make a way for ordinary people like you and me to be made right with God. So if we ever find ourselves asking, what does God think about our situation right now? Uh, what does God think about uh, all the suffering uh, and misery caused by the coronavirus? Well, we can ask ourselves, what do we think Jesus would think about this? 
How would Jesus respond to a need like this if he encountered it? We remember that, that Jesus, the one who had compassion on the social outcast, the one who healed the sick wherever he found them, the one who fed the hungry. What would Jesus think about these things? How would Jesus want to help those that are in need? If we want to know what God is like, then the person of Jesus is where we see God most clearly. So if you ever find yourselves doubting God's goodness, doubting God's love, then let me encourage you. Take another look at Jesus and you'll see clearly how God wants us to respond and how he wants each of us uh, to act uh, to the challenges uh, around us as we face them. The third promise uh, that Jesus gives that we'll look at here is right at the end of our reading. It's the promise that even though Jesus is no longer going to be physically present, he is going to continue to work powerfully through his friends. And as we continue on uh, next week, we'll read about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit and the way that God fulfilled that uh, through him. But let's pick up our, our reading again in verse uh, 12 where we read Jesus saying this. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now there's... Uh, an invitation if there ever was one. You know, one of uh, the biggest questions that people might ask themselves uh, from time to time is this, you know, what is the point of my life? Uh, people might ask uh, in a way, uh, how can I be part of something, something bigger than myself, something bigger than my life? How can I make a difference? How can my life leave a mark on the world? How can I change things for the better? Here, uh, Jesus invites his friends to do just that, to continue the good works that he did. And he promises his full support to them as they do it. And his promise here is pretty big. This is something that we can see Jesus is going out of his way to emphasize to his friends that his friends might even do greater works than he did, that he will hear and answer the prayers of his friends that when they ask and act in his name, Jesus will make sure that those prayers, those actions are answered by his support. You know, why? Not so we look good, but so that the glory would go to God the Father through Jesus the Son. Jesus here is inviting us to, to go big, to pray big, to act big, act big uh, depending on his faithfulness and that he is a, someone who keeps his promises. Do you know, if our relationship with God has been one where uh, we're asking God to help us uh, live our lives in the best way that we think possible, then our experience of the Christian life is probably uh, going to have been quite disappointing. We might feel like God answers our prayers sometimes and not others. We might be a bit confused about many of the things that Jesus promises for his followers. But if we do it the other way around, if we give our lives wholeheartedly to Jesus, if in our prayers we're asking God to help us do the works of Jesus, to live and act faithfully in the name of Jesus, then we are probably going to have quite a fun and exciting and fruitful experience of the Christian life. I'm sure it's going to be hard work too, but it will be exciting as we discover how ready Jesus is to back up his promises here with help when we need it. And many of us, I'm sure, will have stories we can share about the times when God has done just that. So this is how Jesus encouraged his friends when they were facing their time of uncertainty. He encouraged them to remember that their future beyond death was going to be with him in the household of God, as part of God's own family. He promised them that in him, in Jesus, we could see God the Father. We could see clearer than anything in, the, in his life, in his teaching and his works, what God was really like. And he promised them 
that his friends would have lives of significance in following him, that God would work through them powerfully because he, Jesus, was going to, far, to the Father and he himself would be at work through them. Promises Jesus gave for his friends then and they're promises for each friend of Jesus today. So a, a question and a challenge to end with. Do you want what Jesus promises to his friends here? Maybe to simply receive and accept it in a fresh way once more, but maybe also to make that decision for the very first time. Let me give you a moment to, to think about uh, and consider how you might answer that question. Do you want what Jesus promises for his friends here? So if you want to say yes to what Jesus is offering his friends, let me invite you to pray with me now. Lord Jesus, I want to know you as a friend in the closest way possible. Please help me. I'm sorry for all the mistakes I've made in life. Please forgive me. Please come into my life now in a fresh and new way. I welcome you into my heart. Come and fill me with your presence more and more. Help me to know that my future is safe in your hands. Jesus, my friend, please give me your strength to face the challenges I've got in my life right now. And in your strength, help me to overcome each one. Jesus, please help me receive now the peace that you want me to know. And fill me too with the courage to do what you want me to do every day. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen.